Hello to everyone, this is your host, Timothy F. Kaufman, and you're listening to The Diving Board, a podcast that focuses on the conversion testimonies of Protestants who convert to Roman Catholicism, thinking that to be deep in history is to cease to be a Protestant. But getting deep in history is something a Roman Catholic cannot do, because Roman Catholicism itself is a novelty 300 years removed from the Church of the Apostles and their followers. Its roots do not go back any further than the end of the 4th century. And, as we continue to show in each episode, those Roman Catholics who think that they are getting deep in history are actually very shallow in it, embracing a late 4th century and medieval novelty as if it were the Church of Christ. This is episode 11, the final episode we'll be doing on the conversion of Marcus Grodi, and next time we'll be analyzing another testimony of a convert to Roman Catholicism. Mr. Grodi is the host of the Journey Home Show, a regular broadcast on the Coming Home Network, a Roman Catholic ministry that focuses on the return of wandering Protestants back to the fold of Roman Catholicism. Marcus Grodi has provided citations from the early church fathers that influenced his decision to return to Rome, and we encourage our listeners to go back and listen to his entire testimony. He divided his citations into four main categories. The church hierarchy, the Eucharist, which is to him the Lord's Supper and the Roman sacrifice of the Mass, the primacy of Rome, and the unity of the church. We have covered the church hierarchy and the Eucharist already, and today we will address his misperceptions on the primacy of the city of Rome, or the Bishop of Rome, and the presumed unity of the church that is based on unity under the Bishop of Rome. Now, some of his material we have discussed in our analysis of the conversion testimony of Father Ray Ryland in the first three episodes of this podcast, and we will see a lot of this going forward. The Roman Catholic apologists tend to cite the same data and make the same arguments, and to refute them all repeatedly would be repetitive. So we will attempt merely to summarize the arguments here and then point to the episode that addresses the specific point in more detail. So let's get started. On the matter of the primacy of Rome, Mr. Grodi cites Clement of Rome from the 1st century and Ignatius of Antioch and Irenaeus of Lyons from the 2nd century, and Cyprian of Carthage from the 3rd century. An interesting selection of church fathers representing three continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe, ostensibly in support of Rome. He also includes some citations from the late 4th century and the early 5th, but those are of very little concern to us since they arose in the latter part of the 4th century, as we have stated at various times. In this podcast, we address citations from the first three centuries to show what a novelty Roman Catholicism really is, Okay, let's get started with Clement. Here is Marcus Grodi with his first citation on the primacy of Rome, from the letter of Clement to the Corinthians in the first century. Now I'm going to another subject that was important to me, and this has to do with, all right, what about Rome? What about the importance of Rome? And I'm taking you back to St. Clement. Now he is the bishop of Rome writing to the church at Corinth, and the significance of that is, it isn't a church next door. He's writing from essentially Italy over to Greece. So what authority does he have to tell the church at Corinth to do anything? If there's no connection between the churches and the hierarchy, then is there any authority between the bishop of Rome and the people over in Corinth? Hear this quote from St. Clement. Owing to the sudden and repeated calamities and misfortunes which have befallen us, we must acknowledge that we have been somewhat tardy in turning our attention to the matters in dispute among you, beloved. Accept our consul, and you will have nothing to regret. If anyone disobey the things which have been said by him through us, let them know that they will involve themselves in transgression and in no small danger. You will afford us joy and gladness if, being obedient to the things which we have written through the Holy Spirit, you will root out the wicked passion of jealousy. St. Clement, the bishop of Rome, is speaking with authority to the people over in Greece and that church, the church of Corinth, a very, uh, an earlier church established by Paul, but he's calling them to obey his command, saying that they will give him great joy if they obey us. It's interesting that whenever the Pope writes an encyclical, he uses this phrase, us, meaning that he is speaking not just for his own authority, but as the man appointed by Christ as the head of the church. Clement is doing that in this very early document. 
And you'll see lots of things in this that imply that there's an authority in the Bishop of Rome over the leaders in Corinth. Okay, so his first argument is that because Rome was such a great distance from Corinth, and yet Corinth appealed to Rome for help, it must have some significance regarding Rome's authority. Yes, it is true. The church at Corinth wrote to the church at Rome, which was across the Adriatic Sea. And Clement wrote back to the church at Corinth and asked the Corinthians to write back and let him know how they were progressing. That's from Clement to the Corinthians, paragraph 65. Ignatius, the bishop of Antioch, wrote letters to Ephesus, Trilus, Magnesia, Rome, Philadelphia, and Smyrna, and asked them to write letters back to him. For example, Ignatius of Antioch to the Smyrnaeans, paragraph 11, and also to send delegates who could journey to the church at Antioch, as in his letter to Polycarp, chapter 7. The church at Philippi, which was just a stone's throw from Thessalonica, wrote instead to Polycarp, bishop of the church at Smyrna, which was, in fact, across the Aegean Sea, to ask advice, and Polycarp of Smyrna wrote back to Philippi to answer them. That's Polycarp to Philippi, paragraph 3. In their letter to Polycarp, the church at Philippi requested that their letter to him be duplicated and forwarded to Antioch, and further requested that copies of Ignatius' letters be sent to Philippi. And Ignatius wrote to Polycarp requesting that the letter from Philippi be forwarded to him. Polycarp agreed to all of these requests, as indicated in Polycarp to the Philippians. Paragraph 13. And when Polycarp died, the church at Smyrna wrote to Philomelium, and requested that the letter be copied and sent to other churches that were even more remote. That's paragraph 20 of the Martyrdom of Polycarp. The fact is, the early churches wrote to each other constantly, seeking advice, offering counsel, occasionally offering rebuke, and always eagerly receiving news from their sister churches throughout the world. Corinth seeking advice from Rome across the Adriatic Sea, when they could have written to Ephesus, is no more evidence of Roman primacy. Then the church at Philippi is seeking advice from Smyrna across the Aegean Sea when they could have written to Thessalonica as evidence of Smyrnaean primacy. The only way someone like Marcus Grodi could be persuaded of Roman primacy by Clement's letter to Corinth is if he himself was ignorant of the history of the early church, and he very clearly is. And that brings us to our second point. It is important to know about this history because, just as Rome wrote to Corinth to correct the schismatic element there, sometimes other churches would write to Rome to admonish their erring presbyters and rebuke them for creating a schism. And then the bishop of Rome would write back to that bishop, thanking him for correcting his erring flock. Marcus Grodi does not mention those letters, and in fact may not even be aware of them. In any case, it is a common deception in which Roman apologists rely on your ignorance of history, or in fact displays his own ignorance of history, so that you will conclude that you too are deep in history, when in fact you are still in the very shallow end of the history pool with the Roman apologist. You can hear more of our arguments on this point in our first episode when Father Ray Ryland attempted to make the similar point, but for now let me remind the listener that there was a similar schism in Rome in the 3rd century, and Cyprian of Carthage wrote to the schismatics in Rome, commanding that they acquiesce in these my letters, and demanding that they behave in a more orderly fashion, more in keeping with the truth of the gospel. That's Cyprian to the Roman Schismatics, Epistle 43. Afterward, the Roman bishop wrote to Cyprian, letting him know that the schism had ended, that's Epistle 45, and the Schismatics wrote to Cyprian to notify him of their repentance and return to the unity of the church, that's Epistle 49. On another occasion, Christians imprisoned in Rome, because of their confession of faith, wrote to Carthage to inform Cyprian that we have been lifted up by the receipt of your letter, and it was their chief consolation, and that in the duty of his episcopate he had frequently confirmed the confessors by your letters. That's Epistle 25 to Cyprian from the Roman Confessors, paragraphs 1 and 6. And I know what you're thinking. Why would the Roman Church seek advice and receive counsel? and correction, comfort, and instruction from across the Mediterranean Sea in Carthage when the Roman church was so much closer to Rome. I think we can all agree that Rome is in fact very close to Rome. Geographically speaking, of course, it's exactly zero miles away. And yet a bishop from all the way across the sea, Cyprian of Carthage, intervened from a great distance to settle Rome's affairs and comfort its confessors. 
So, we here at the Diving Board believe in second chances, and we're going to give Marcus Grodi another go at this. In Epistle 25 of the Library of Cyprian's Epistles, the Roman confessors wrote to Cyprian to thank him, and in Epistle 43, Cyprian intervenes in the affairs of the Roman Church and demands that they acquiesce to his instructions, and there's obviously only one possible reason in the world for a bishop in Africa to tell a congregation in Rome what to do. That's right. You guessed it. Carthaginian Episcopal primacy, obviously. The Bishop of Carthage obviously must have had universal powers in the early church. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Grodi is now in possession of the communications between Cyprian and the Roman Church, and we have the rare opportunity to hear Mr. Grodi think through this live as he concludes the obvious, that the church at Carthage had universal Episcopal authority from the very earliest days of the church. Let's listen in as Marcus Grodi asks, what about Carthage? What about the authority of Carthage? Now I'm going to another subject that was important to me, and this has to do with, all right, what about Carthage? What about the importance of Carthage down in Africa? I'm taking you back to St. Cyprian of Carthage, writing to the church at Rome, and the significance of that is, it isn't a church next door. He's writing from essentially Africa over to Italy. So what authority does he have to tell the church at Rome to do anything? If there's no connection between the churches and the hierarchy, then is there any authority between the Bishop of Carthage and the people over in Rome? St. Cyprian of Carthage, the Bishop of Carthage down in Africa, is speaking with authority to the people over in Italy. And that church, the Church of Rome, a very, uh, an earlier church established by Paul, but he's calling them to obey his command. Cyprian of Carthage is doing that in this very early document. And you'll see lots of things in this that imply that there's an authority in the Bishop of Carthage over the leaders in Rome. Okay, okay, we are in fact being facetious, obviously, because Mr. Grodi did not say those things. At least, he did not say those things in that order. That is all Mr. Grodi edited to have him make the same argument about Carthage, based on the letter from Cyprian, as he made about Rome, based on the letter from Clement. Our point is simply that the Roman apologist's argument is foolish and empty to anyone who has read the correspondence of the early church. And you might ask why Marcus Grodi would not mention this incident. The incident of Cyprian intervening in the schism at Rome, or the Roman confessors writing to Cyprian to tell him how appropriate it was for him to be writing to them to comfort them, or... Philippi's request for help from Smyrna and Smyrna's response. Why indeed would Marcus not mention these things? It's because for all of his arguments from the early church fathers, Marcus Grodi is still wading in the kiddie pool, still wearing his floaties. And frankly, not only does he prefer to remain in ignorance, but he also insists that you remain in ignorance with him. Because if you got too deep in history, his whole house of cards would fall apart. Okay, one more example just for fun. Bishops Basilides and Martialis in Spain had stumbled in sin and were forced out of the ministry, and the Spanish congregation had since appointed other bishops in their place. But Basilides and Martialis had second thoughts and consulted with Bishop Stephen in Rome. Stephen took their side and ordered the church at Spain to reinstate them, but the Spanish congregation would have none of it, and wrote to Cyprian of Carthage for advice. Cyprian responded that the Spanish congregation was exactly right to do what it did, and further, that they did not have to listen to Stephen, because Stephen was wrong to maintain communion with Basilides and Martialis, and by doing so had become a partaker of their sins. Besides, Stephen had been deceived by them and wasn't thinking clearly, having been surprised by fraud, in Cyprian's words. You can read the whole story in Cyprian, Epistle 67, to the clergy and people abiding in Spain. Now, why do you suppose the congregation in Spain did not obey Stephen? And why did they write to Cyprian for a second opinion? And why did Cyprian tell them they could ignore Stephen because he didn't know what he was talking about? It's because Rome wasn't the chief episcopate of Grodi's imagination. That's why. And it is simply ridiculous for Grodi to try to establish Roman primacy from that letter from Rome to Corinth. To do so is evidence of his ignorance, not of his knowledge. Okay, the next thing he said was that Clement claimed that the Holy Spirit was writing to the Corinthians through the letter from Rome, that is, by him through us. And here again is Marcus Grodi making that point. 
If anyone disobey the things which have been said by him through us, let them know that they will involve themselves in transgression and in no small danger. You will afford us joy and gladness if, being obedient to the things which we have written through the Holy Spirit, you will root out the wicked passion of jealousy. St. Clement, the Bishop of Rome, is speaking with authority. Okay, we actually covered this in our first episode, but the long and the short of it is that Clement is not asking them to submit to him, but to the scriptures, and then goes on to cite a lot of scriptures in which the Holy Spirit is mentioned. Some English translations make it sound like Clement said the Holy Spirit had written the letter from Rome to Corinth, but as we pointed out in episode one on Father Ray Ryland, that makes Clement's letter inconsistent because Clement, in his original Greek, actually uses the plural Greek definite article to describe the scriptures as the truths of the Holy Spirit. To say that the Holy Spirit had written that very letter as well makes it appear that Clement thought his own letter, too, was scripture. But there is more. There is a question of whether the letter is even translated correctly at that point. For example, in James A. Cleast's 1949 translation of chapter 63, verse 2, Clement is asking the Corinthians to be obedient to what we have written through the Holy Spirit. And J.B. Lightfoot's 1890 translation rendered it similarly, Render obedience unto the things written by us through the Holy Spirit. But as we pointed out in episode 1, Cleast was a Jesuit and Lightfoot was an Anglican who conceded early primacy to the Bishop of Rome, and both of them saw Clement's words here as evidence that the Bishop of Rome recognized his universal authority. Both translators attached the phrase, through the Holy Spirit, to the things written by us, to make Clement appear to claim that his own letter is inspired by the Holy Spirit. But two other Protestant translators rendered it differently and attached the phrase, through the Holy Spirit, to the repentance that Clement seeks from the Corinthians. Charles Houle's 1885 translation renders it, Obedient to the things that have been written by us, you put an end, by the suggestion of the Holy Spirit, to the unlawful wrath of your discord. And John Keith's 1896 translation renders it, If you become obedient to the words written by us, and through the Holy Spirit root out the lawlessness of your jealousy. Houle's and Keith's translations are obviously more consistent with Clement, since throughout the letter he has invoked the Holy Spirit's movement in the believer toward an attitude of repentance, as you can see in paragraphs 7, 8, 13, 16, 56, and 57 of the same letter. So, it is a very weak argument to say that Clement claimed his own letter was written to Corinth by the Holy Spirit through the Bishop of Rome. Like I said, you can go back to episode 1 on Father Ray Ryland and give that another listen. <laughs> 